Okay, here we go. So, testing. Okay. So, how to develop a social media policy or burn everything the feds are here? <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> Yes, it's police. Uh, sorry, it should have said policy. Spell check. <laughs> Both actually work. Uh, okay, so here's what you need to consider when you're developing a social media policy is you need protection, disclosure, and transparency. So the protection is for both you and your employees. You have to consider both sides of who's being protected. Uh, you need to be as transparent as possible. So you have to be clear on what you're going to, if you're going to look at their Facebook you have, or Twitter, you have to be clear that you are going to look at this and you have to be clear on what you are looking for. You can't just look at their account and say, oh, I see you were uh, drunk this day, you were at work this day, so I'm guessing you were drunk at work, so I'm gonna fire you. You can't do that. Uh, disclosure would basically be pretty similar to transparency. You're gonna tell them what you're looking at and tell them when you're looking at it. You can't do this behind their back. I've heard more and more that the lack of a social media profile actually can income can make it so you can't get a job. Is that? It depends. Um, a lot of employers now are using your social media accounts to decide whether they want to hire you or not because they may approve or disapprove of what you do in your off time. And ethically speaking, that's not allowed because your social media is your private life. If you're doing it right, yes. Uh, if you actually read most of your settings, um, you can set it up so only people who are marked as friends or yeah, friends of friends. Yeah. Um, a lot of that, unfortunately, does fall to the person, but the general consensus is that. Well, technically, first, you should never post something that you're not willing to have carved in stone and last until the end of time. <laughs> but you should consider your Facebook to be yours, and your boss shouldn't be looking at what you're doing with you and your friends on your off hours, is how it's supposed to go. That's not how it works, but that's how it's supposed to work. Okay, so the perspectives are first privacy versus security. Um, you can make your policy absolutely secure, cover every possible base, and be as invasive as you want to your employees, or you can respect each other's privacy. Either side has some advantages and disadvantages. On one hand, if you've covered your security, you're almost guaranteed to have proper legal recourse for anything you don't want your employee to post online. Switch side of this, privacy. If you do that, your employee has, well, probably the right to protest because it can be considered an invasion of privacy, um, as well as the fact that they might just say, no, I'm not signing this, I'm not working for you if you're going to treat me like this when I'm not working online. Um, there's also some consideration for the fact that I can go right now, set up another Facebook under a different name, tell just my close friends about it, and still post pictures of me, and you might not know about it at all. So if you are too draconian in your security policies, there are ways around them. They leave you vulnerable again. So it's important to try and strike a balance between the two so that people understand you're trying to protect yourself and them, and they don't want to go out and create another account just because they feel too restrained. The next one would be individual rights and agency rights. People have the right to say that they don't want to be posted about online. They have the right to say, I don't want you to mention my name, I don't want you to take my picture, I don't want you to put any video of me online. Incidentally, I'm waiving that right if anyone wants to post this online. Um, and yeah, if they say no, you have to respect that. Uh, the agency also has rights in that you can say you 
want them to post about you or you don't want them to post about you. And it's a little bit more gray depending on the agency. Typically, the larger your agency, the harder it is to say, we don't want you posting about us. Uh, for a really small agency like Shining Mountains, we can usually get away with saying, please do not post about us online. Um, because we are a small agency who wants to maintain the privacy of our clientele. That's possible, but again, the larger you get, the harder it gets to do that. Okay, so first perspective is the employee. Uh, you have to remember that for most people, their social media account is their personal life. Uh, they're posting what they're gonna do, where they're gonna be, who they had fun with, or if they've got plans tonight. I could write a tweet and say, I'm going out to the bar tonight, who wants to come with me? And my friends would retweet that, oh sure, they'll be there. Or they've got plans. Um, on Facebook, it's the same thing. Most younger people now prefer to use Facebook over Twitter. Um, but yeah, they'll write the same post that I'm going here or I'm doing this. And then while they're doing it, they might write, we're at the bar X, we're having a great time. They'll post pictures of it, uh, maybe video. But as far as they are concerned, this is them with their friends, not at work, and it has nothing to do with anyone at work, except for people who they know from work who came with them. So it's their personal life. Uh, think of it as before the internet, when you might call up your friends and go to the bar, your boss might and turn up at the bar, but it's off hours, he can't say, I saw you were at the bar last night, and because you were both off work. Um, next, we're gonna step down to the right to privacy, because that's closer to personal life. Everyone has the right to have privacy in their personal life, no matter how much of it they're actually airing online. It's kind of a gray area because they are airing it online and you can see it. Um, I'll actually walk through this uh, later when I bring up the social media policy I wrote, but suffice it to say, if they are not mentioning your company or your agency and it is at clearly not working hours, you cannot say anything, you cannot reprimand them for it, you cannot take any action against them because they didn't mention you, it was off hours. Similarly, I will cover this in a bit, but I prefer to take a privacy first standpoint and go with, so long as they did not mention anything about work, then their right to privacy stands first. Next is right to protest. election but that young woman who was elected as an MLA and then posts from previous years became the subject mm -hmm. of a lot of scrutiny um, and uh, in my opinion not great choices but still I thought it was kind of irrelevant to her work you're right it was <laughs> but she got kicked off of caucus anyway it was entirely irrelevant to her work um, the what happened there is a image issue. Um, because you represent the government, the government thinks that they own your image. So what you're doing off hours, or what you did before you ran, they consider theirs because it reflects on them. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily true, and we're actually going to be covering exactly that in a later slide. Right. Well, what about, for example, Ralph Klein when he was a premier, and there are pictures of him giving the finger to the electorate. I mean, nobody said he there was anything, you know, he wasn't yeah. turfed because of that. And this a young woman, not in her public life, just, you know, posed for some pictures that were questionable, right? It falls into <laughs> the celebrity status that having a social media account technically gives you. Your image, as far as the people you're working for are concerned is theirs. It's not, but they like to think it is. And they like to think that how you present yourself reflects on them and they should control that. It's 
again, an annoying gray issue that I take the stand of privacy first. If it's before you were working for me, it doesn't affect your work for me, and it's happening when you're not working for me, so after you get off work, not my business. So long as you are not mentioning anything about your work, I have no right to complain. If you want to take pictures of yourself streaking down the street nude and it's after five o'clock you've left the office, so long as there's no pictures of the office in that, you don't mention that you just got off work from the office, take your pictures, post them, they're your off hour stuff. That's my standpoint, and like I said, I come from a privacy first perspective. Uh, next is the right to protest. Uh, this is here because it kind of overrides some of the company rights. Um, how many of you are familiar with some of the stuff Walmart's done? Okay, Walmart, Walmart has historically fired people for posting bad stuff about them online when they worked for Walmart. Like, say, posting that they got locked in the store overnight because the managers wanted them to do something overnight. This has happened a couple of times in the States, and when those people posted about it, they were fired. Um, you, the employee has the right to protest any action that is against the workers' code, uh, against the code of ethics, or anything similar. If, if you shouldn't have done it, they have every right to, pro to post that you did this and they have to. They have the right to protest you with a sign out front for your stuff just as much as they have the right to protest you online. And those protest rights should extend to their online account. Technically, because our laws haven't quite developed there yet, they don't, and legally speaking, Walmart was entirely in the right to fire them for the official reasons given, even though it's quite obvious that it was over the protest that they put online. Legally speaking, they could do that. Technically speaking, ethically speaking, they should not have. So again, you have to remember, people have the right to complain about you. Okay, next. Okay. The organization, first up, image is everything. How you are seen online literally affects everything online. If people think your agency is doing X, then it will spread like wildfire. Rumors live online. You've heard about people who've committed suicide because of online rumors. The same is true for agencies. It can break or create your agency's image. You need to protect this vehemently. I know this is a full 180 from what I was just talking about, but online, what people think of you really does matter. It doesn't matter what you do, it matters what people think about you. You have celebrity status, so every tabloid article that could ruin a celebrity can now ruin you online, because people will start a rumor, it might become popular, it'll spread, and then people will, in the real world, say, oh, but I heard you did this. Even if that didn't happen, because it's online and it was untrue, it's affecting you now. So you really need to control things that are happening regarding your image that aren't true. This also means you may want to consider spin doctoring some of these rumors as soon as you hear them. So. Say you heard a story X, you know it's not true. Well, the obvious thing is to just come out and say it's not true. The problem is people won't always believe that because they'll think you're covering your ass. If it's a minor rumor that it is clearly untrue, like absolutely no one in their right mind would believe this, ignore it, don't even look at it because it is so far out there most sane people will go with, that can't be true. If it is something plausible that could have happened, you need to immediately take action and say, this didn't happen, here is why, and you need to provide proof that it didn't happen. On social media? 
again, it's the rumor mill. If, okay, so you're a director in something, there's someone who has a normal, friendly relationship with you, and someone else starts a rumor that you're sleeping together, and it's inappropriate because of your positions. You need to prove that that's not happening because it sounds plausible enough that... So we're talking personal and not organizational? It is organization. They're saying that the director of this organization is sleeping with this other member of the organization, and it is compromising for the organization in some way. I know it's a lot of gray areas. The, the problem with social media is it is a tangled mess, which is why, like I said, I will answer all your questions as we're going. Did that, that help at all? Yeah. No? Uh, and just like as an organization, you have to be fairly careful you of do. what you're putting out there, regardless of whether you might have a disgruntled employee out there who might be spouting stuff on Facebook. You've got to be very careful. There's a fine line of yep. what you're going to be when, when the disgruntled employee is doing this, what you want to do is basically explain, this person no longer works for us, this is not happening, and it's a little harder to prove an affair or something, or disprove it, but you basically need to come out with a statement that says, no, this isn't happening, this is the source of the rumor, he's not a valuable uh, source of information on this. That's kind of what I'm talking about. You have to basically nip the rumor in the bud, saying that this person cannot be speaking truthfully or has a bias against us. Next up is networking. So most agencies will want their employees to be friends with them on Facebook. This is a good idea. This is useful and helpful. Because when you put something on your Facebook, it will appear on all your employees' Facebooks if they are friends with you and watching you. From there, if they like this post, they can share it, and it will appear on their Facebook. From there, it will appear on every friend of their Facebook. And if they like it, their friends can share it, and it continues to propagate. So if you want to get a message out there quickly, and you have employees who are watching you on Facebook, well, you cannot tell them they need to watch, be friends with you or share this stuff. You can encourage it, and if they do share it, their friends will see it, and if their friends like it, they will share it, and it can spread much quicker that way. In the course of an afternoon, if, a few, if enough people like it, it can take over Facebook. This is how you have those stories on Facebook that go from one post to a, a million views in an afternoon. Because everyone is connected, everyone is watching each other, and it just spreads like wildfire. So you want to encourage networking with your employees, and personally I think the best way to do this is to create as balanced a policy as you can, saying you will respect their privacy, and they are under no obligation to share this stuff, but it is helpful for the agency if they are your friend. Both in a literal friend me on Facebook way and a figurative we want to all be friends working together. Okay, so here we go, the crossover. First up, the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon. How many of you even know that reference? I thought it was six degrees. <laughs> okay, basically, the story is this. In Hollywood, no one is more than seven degrees removed from Kevin Bacon. You have a friend who knows a friend who knows a friend who knows a friend. Um, in any related community, it's going to be the same. All of the Aboriginal agencies probably know each other on some level. All of the AIDS agencies probably know each other on some level. All of the agencies dealing with a similar topic know each other on some level and interact on some level. Conversely, your employees probably know these agencies and might be friends with them on Facebook or friends with employees of them on Facebook. And the issue with this is what starts in one place can ripple to all of them. So it might not actually be reasonable to say you 
don't know someone before you meet them. You might meet them for the first time, but you might have heard of them through the grapevine online because everyone is so connected now. It used to be you could graduate, no one would know your name, but now you might be in your social work program, uh, friends with some people online who are friends with an agency, or you became friends with that agency through doing a placement or a practicum, and now that agency knows you and people who watch that agency and their friends list might know you as well. And they might be watching your Facebook or conversely people you didn't even know could be looking at your Facebook connected to you and you didn't even know it. And then we come to memes. Memes are the genes of society. How many of you even know what a meme is? One, two, okay, great. So yeah, a meme is basically a social trait that it propagates. The internet is considered the primordial soup of them because the strong survive and the weak perish. Um, great example, um, let's see, what are the, what's a good example? Um, something popular recent. Okay, we'll go with the My Little Pony thing. How many of you remember that huge explosion online? Uh, not too long ago, I think it was three years ago it started, basically Hasbro did a reboot of the series and immediate reaction, everyone hated it, this is a bad idea. And then people watched it and suddenly people who weren't even going to be interested in the show watched it. The result was a drastic change in behavior online that a lot of people who weren't watching the meme still noticed. People became politer people became nicer because this show that had its popularity birthed online was showing people to be nice to each other. The concept carried over to the individuals and they behaved better online. What can happen with a meme is you can start a small idea and it will influence people without them noticing it simply because they are so exposed to it. So. You can start an awareness campaign online, and if it gets ingrained enough in the online community, it will just become a, yeah, that's basic knowledge. Everyone knows that. Just like now, it's a lot more common for people to say, yeah, of course you shouldn't call someone something horrible online. You shouldn't say that stuff. You should be at least semi-polite, is how it's become, whereas before, the internet was ruled by trolls, still is. We're never gonna get rid of them. Uh, a troll is someone who, they literally live to make everyone else's life hell. They will lie, they will find a minor thing, they will blow it out of proportion, they will have absolutely no connection to any of you, they will just be looking through Facebook or Twitter or anything where you're posting for a fire they can start. These people are absolutely atrocious. They want attention. They want to start shit. They want to make people angry. And like I said, they may have absolutely no connection to your agency at all. It could be someone, take the concierge downstairs. None of us have ever met them. They might just be bored one night, go online, go through our Facebooks and go with, hmm, what looks like something I can exploit here, make into an issue, and then just start posting about it, repost your post, and then add horrible inflammatory comments onto their page, and their viewers will see it and agree with them, and share what the troll shared with their own comments on it, and that's what a troll does. There is no good defense. The best defense has always been to ignore them whenever you can. When a troll is really getting after you, your second best defense is to be logical, rational, and unemotional. You respond with a, no, this did not happen, here are the facts, in a flat, neutral, boring tone. You do not give them any of what they want. Um, 
covers all the core stuff for her. Uh, yeah. A couple of questions. Uh, first, would you recommend having a personal Facebook account, personal Twitter, Twitter account, and a separate business or something? Yes. That is actually often a very good idea. Um, it's more common to see that on YouTube than it is in Facebook, but people will oftentimes create uh, separate accounts for separate issues. This is me in my personal life, this is me in my academic or my business life, and what will happen is you might make a post in your personal life and say, you should go check out this Facebook or this YouTube page where I'm doing my professional stuff because I think you'll be interested in it. Um, conversely, you can do the same from your per, uh, public professional one to your private, it's just much less common. Um, great examples can be of this can actually be found online in YouTube where it's a lot more common. There will be people with three or four different YouTube accounts. Um, one I know of right now I believe is um, Game Theorists. Guy I watch it has a game theory account, a film theory account, and another one where he actually goes through and teaches you how to grow a social media presence. Um, he does very few videos on that one because this is how he makes his living outside of his two accounts. One last thing. Um, LinkedIn never really took off. It's used by a lot of businesses, but do any of you even remember what happened, what there was before Facebook? MySpace. Yep. Just like MySpace is kind of a forgotten relic today, LinkedIn doesn't seem to have much of a future. If you want to use it, great but it's not popular enough to really grow your social presence online. Um, similarly, the Google Plus and Google Hangouts, while the Google Hangouts video function is quite popular, the Google Plus social media accounts died. There's, I think, a thousand active accounts for the Google Plus social media, and considering Google's size and then the size of Facebook, may as well consider it a ghost town. Um, the best thing to do is basically find the youngest person in your agency and ask where they put their social media stuff. Where do they go to watch videos? Where do they go to post about their life in general? That's what's probably the most alive right now. And right now that is Facebook, that is YouTube. Um, Twitter is Twitter is now more popular for the older group, so everyone here, but it is much less popular for high school students and college students now. A <laughs> little bit, actually, a little bit, yeah. Uh, if you want to play the second link there, that's the troll song. Chuck, what about Instagram? That is actually popular. Because my daughter said that yep. Facebook is over and it's Instagram. That's the thing now. Facebook's but, probably but not going to die quite. But she lamented that. She said, I prefer Facebook, but all my friends are doing Instagram now. Yeah. Um, right now, it's actually a war between the two. Um, part of that war is because, how many of you have ever read Facebook's policy? The stuff you just, the long, long legal document, probably about a hundred and some pages, really boring, you all just click agree? Yeah? No one ever reads it? Oh, okay. Well, let's uh, give you some horrible information then. Facebook owns everything you post. Every idea you post on there, they own. Texting can be perpetuity. Yep. Forever, ever, ever, yep. Any picture of you that you post, Facebook has the rights to that. Facebook has the rights to everything you talk about on there. They can sell these this information to anyone they want. And they are also compositing a very accurate 3D model of yourself based on all of your pictures that is being used to develop an advanced face recognition program. This recognition program is 99.5% accurate. 
And human natural recognition is 99.8% accurate. Go humans. And you've legally consented for Facebook to use your pictures to further develop this program. And that you are fine with being registered in this program's database. Because you clicked agree. Wasn't there, isn't there an argument to be made that you're not really giving consent to that when they give you a 200 page yes. green pins? <laughs> there is that argument. That argument lost in a court of law. Well, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, it sucks horribly. Yeah. Um, because more and more, any interaction you have on the internet at all is through yep. a social media portal. Like, yep. And Facebook is considered the worst because their policy effectively gives them the rights to you. And you can't complain about it. Well, you can complain. Well, you can complain, <laughs> but you can't win. They've already won. Because you click the document and they can say that you didn't read it, but you were supposed to. And by clicking agree right next to the agree box in really tiny print, it says that I have read this document in full, understand, and consent. It is in really tiny gray print, just slightly more visible than the white background. But because you clicked the agree box, the assumption is you read it. Whether you did or not, it's terrible. Okay. Um, 